How are you? I'm fine, thank you. So what's the story with old games in 2019? I played a lot of them, but mainly just on the Switch. The consumer base for the console grew dramatically over the course of the year, but there wasn't a Breath of the Wild or Mario Odyssey. No big tentpole game that every Switch owner crowded around. 2019 was about diversifying into niche stuff and filling up the eShop with publishers' back catalogues. Fine for me, it opened me up to giving my full attention to some older games that I'd previously overlooked. Let's get into that. I know Doom fine. Not as well as the PC elite who play it on the harder settings of course, but I've played a lot of pishy old console ports over the years. It's a great, punchy, nervous series of mazes and hellspawn. I'd never really bothered with the sequel though. For 4 quid on the Switch it seemed like an easy purchase to jump in on. It's hardly a refinement, but it's a wallowing in what gives Doom such a lasting impression. It's dumb, it's overwhelming and it's vicious. Doom 2 is full of chainsaws and cyrodemons and blood. It's gloriously juvenile. The level design is a bit messier and more demanding, but it's kind of what you'd want. Doom 2 is like playing about in the wreckage of the first game. It's great that history's treated this messy 1994 PC thing with such lavish attention. Doom 2 too messy for you? Look no farther. Super hot is slick as man. If you know what this is, you've already had the core mechanic explained to you eight dozen times already, but you might not, so I'll do it quickly. Super hot is an FPS where time only moves forward when you move. You jump into messy shootouts, and as long as you're careful about how and when you move, you can take out hordes of baddies unscathed. It's a really nice system. It seems like since Hotline Miami came out, pretty much everyone doing an indie action game has attempted to deconstruct it or riff on it. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I'd say if it's leading towards games as unique and diverse as Katana Zero, Ape Out, My Friend Pedro and Superhot, it's a really good thing. Superhot puts the formula in 3D to make gunplay a little more complex and balances it out by giving you as much time as you want to react to enemies. The quick turnaround after death encourages you to try bolder and more improvised solutions to each scenario. Surviving encounters can feel deeply satisfying, so it's nice that you can indulge in watching your replay after each level. This is a good one. Pick it up. Virtua Racing has always been a big deal for me. I was a kid when the first proper 3D game started to come out, and I don't think there's been a leap in games tech since that has seemed so exciting or fertile. Being a Mega Drive kid, Virtua Racing was the game that I swooned over, even if the ridiculous retail price meant I didn't get to own a copy until I was in my 20s. The idea that you could own a game that looked like the Money for Nothing video seemed mind-blowing at the time. It still kind of is. The limitations that moulded the game's aesthetic have given the game a unique and memorable style. The arches of Virtua Racing's suspension bridge still holds some air of the future in my mind. I think the game has always been great, but the lack of a worthy home version meant the hardcore rarely held it in the same esteem as Outrun or Daytona. M2 have done a fantastic job with the Switch conversion, and the low-poly models transfer beautifully to HD. This is a fantastic Wii Arcade racer, and despite all the challenges it faced during development, I'd go as far to say it's better than the first couple of Ridge racers. I think general opinion is finally starting to shift in Virtua Racing, and it's long overdue. Thank fuck the two and a half years of owning an excellent console without a way to play Resi 4 on it are finally over. The versatility and popularity of the Switch means publishers are obliged to bring their most beloved titles to the system, and looking at the options, there's no more glaring candidate than Resident Evil 4. It's in my all-time top three, and there isn't even a Nintendo game in among that. Resi 4 absolutely nails the fundamentals. The shoulder height camera brings you directly into the gunplay while always making you aware of your character's position and physicality. But unlike the hundreds of action games that have copied this, Resi 4 is flooded with hordes of enemies whose primary attacks are based on lunging at you. Their distance from you is the one thing that determines whether or not they can attack, but their ability to surround you and get behind the camera keeps the action tense and exciting. Gears of War with its armed enemies ducking behind terrain opposite your squad is so fucking boring. The point of this camera system is that it makes you so strong against what you can see, while making you so vulnerable against what you can't. That's enough for a good game right there. But what really makes Resi 4 an all-timer is Mikami's wild imagination and humour. The campaign is paced so deliberately and so playfully. 
relentlessly chucks more at you than you think he can handle, all while subtly adding to your strength. A lot gets made of the early village siege, but there's far too little appreciation for how well considered its following sequences are. It gives you just enough time to feel comfortable with new weapons and ideas before overwhelming you with increasingly absurd threats. By the last half of the game you're running away from a giant mechanical statue that chases you through a stone wall, but it doesn't feel like it's jumping the shark. It's consistent with how each new set piece has been wilder and sillier than the last. We've been right on the shark's back all the way through. The inventory management, treasure hunting and item trading are all high concept JRPG level systems that seem like the kind of thing that could overwhelm players if another game attempted them, but they're so intuitive and well considered in Resi 4 that you kind of forget that they're in there. They're always quietly informing the decisions you make as you attempt to hold off the attacking crowds and giant monsters without giving up too much of your valuable ammo. What really shines on the Switch is the Marshmallows mode. The fact that it's been there since the original release shows how well the developers know their game. The high skill score attack mode is the perfect place for skilled players to retire to once the campaign has become routine. Having the ability to jump in at a moment's notice really makes it shine. For 10 minutes at a time you're playing Resi 4 at its most intense and tactical. It's such a treat to have this on this hybrid console. If you love Resident Evil 4 even nearly as much as I do, Mercenaries makes it an essential addition to your Switch library. Here's your annual Splatoon update. Don't worry, I'll try and be quick. 2019 marked the end of Nintendo's focus in Splatoon 2 and brought us the final fest with Order vs Chaos, hinting at the direction, the story and aesthetic Splatoon 3 will adopt. I've been dying to see the next game since Ultra Expansion showed how well they were able to flesh out a single player Splatoon campaign now. 2 came to the market very soon after the original, solely as a way to push the active Wii U player base onto a new console. Now, with little reason to rush and much more freedom for experimentation, I think 3 will be the Splatoon sequel we've all been waiting for. Ah oh, fuck, I... I don't think this is a new game. I think Nintendo agrees. This is Link's Awakening, the Game Boy Zelda. Every concession to puzzle and environment design that was made for the Game Boy is present here. You might even say that this is the most faithful Zelda remake despite the fact that it's the first one to take no code from the original software. The focus on these remakes seems to be on pleasing the biggest fans of the original games and not altering them to appease to a wider, younger audience. It's an admirable decision. It's definitely a decision I appreciate when they tackled some of the injuries I like more, but many of the things I didn't like about the original Link's Awakening are still massive points of contention in the 2019 release. Throughout the adventure, the long dormant memories of tedium and frustration that built up through my childhood experiences of the Game Boy bubbled up to the surface, and by the last couple of dungeons I was close to a mental breakdown. To call this The Legend of Zelda and have it sit on the shelf beside Breath of the Wild seems absurd, but I love how it further solidifies what Link's Awakening is. The Legend of Zelda is a series wrapped up in notions of the muddy middle ground between history, folklore and legends. I'm quite thankful that the teams dedicated to developing the series forward have the same reverence for its past. So with that out of the way, let's talk about some real Nintendo classics. In September, Nintendo finally made good in their promise to bring SNES games to the Switch, and the Switch became a far better console overnight because of it. Now this thing that I can play Splatoon 2, Resi 4 and Mario Kart 8 on will finally let me play Super Mario World, A Link to the Past and Super Metroid. Getting 20 of these games at once made a lot of people kind of take the surface for granted, but if you get past the novelty of having SNES games on the Switch, you might actually find out what's so good about it. Link's Awakening, a 2019 full price retail game, is really just a scruffy attempt at mimicking what A Link to the Past did so well. Link to the Past this year for free. It's the proper one and everything. Turn to F0 for a bit and remember how actually good it is. These are games that are completely worth our asking prices on eBay, so you really ought to give this some attention. Most of the highlights are quite familiar to me at this point, so if I'm going to prop one up, it's actually going to be one of the NES games. Aye. This is totally worth playing. It can be easy to take decent NES action games for granted, but they're hard to get right. You can tell that from messy revival titles like Blaster Master Zero or Mighty No. 9. Vice Project Doom is exactly what you want from a BT or NES game. A big, cheesy, genre-hopping title that's filled with great music and tight controls. 
I have no idea why Bayou Billy is so well known and this isn't. The difficulty is pretty reasonable and all. I completed it in one sitting and I've tried to remind myself about it every time I've thought about the NES since then. Honestly, it sits quite comfortably among Castlevania and Ninja Gaiden. Props to whoever put in the effort to get this on Nintendo service. It shows that developers remember the times they did good. It's a modest wee game, but absolutely worth a play if you're into this stuff. If you're a subscriber, do me a solid and give this an honest effort. It's not all been switched this year, mind. I did use the old consoles every now and then. Not a lot of standouts, but I'll talk about one. 2019 was kind of the year that I remembered I owned an Xbox. I had this big plan about how I was going to hack it and finally try out THPS 2X. I did hack it, but I think I just ended up fucking up the front end and one of the hard drive partitions. Seriously, if you don't have a bunch of old computer hardware from 2005 knocking about, I think you're best off forgetting about Xbox Homebrew. It did get me to remember that the Xbox is the nicest way to play a lot of the multi-platform PS2 and GameCube stuff though. I haven't gone very far into exploring the library, but the lukewarm response to Free Fields Dangerous Driving reminded me that I haven't played very many Burnout games, or even the best one. Burnout 3 is great. Not the soundtrack, mind you, but just get the Xbox version and play your ripped CDs. It's a massive game that trips over itself to throw more content at you. That's welcome to the gameplay, it's this much fun. Winning races often means having to drive through hectic traffic to build your boost meter. Head to head rivalries are an emotional thing. Sometimes you get so invested in them you might run right into some poor fella's car. Sometimes you miss them by the skin of your teeth. It's as tense as racing games get. After all that, it's nice to jump into a wee crash mode course and try and knock into as much shit as you can. You'll get on really well with Burnout if you can stay cognizant of which activities you'll have the most fun with at the time. Burnout 3's formula has never been better, it's absolutely worth giving a shot. There's a lot out there that will give you a false impression of Final Fantasy VII. At its time, it was a cutting edge system seller that showed the PlayStation could do grand, massive games. It's a game with plot twists and big narrative highs and lows. It's also full of fairly shallow anime tropes, unfashionable design choices and impenetrable optional challenges for hardcore players to boast about. That was my impression going into it. Gamers had put me off, and though there's plenty of good guys who hold real affection for it, I'd kind of dismissed that thinking of who they might have been when they were younger. My route in was through Super Mario RPG, a weirdly contemporary mid-90s Squaresoft game. To my surprise, Final Fantasy VII and Super Mario RPG have a lot in common. Not just mechanically, but both sweet, funny, silly games made by good, sincere people and have been misrepresented by fan bases who only focus on the toughest, edgiest stuff. Gino is the least appealing playable character in Super Mario RPG, but he's the only fucking thing in the game you ever hear about. It's similar for Final Fantasy VII. It's great now to have the ability to play the game in a vacuum, undaunted by whatever people are shouting about. It's great to be able to dismiss Sephiroth as a simple bad guy character and marvel at how daft everyone is. The game looks perfect for what it is, lumpy and angular, but Kate Sith's skinny, open mouthed grin is absolutely spot on. It's a big story with stubby, crude playing pieces, and has a lot of fun with the potential of that. It's not controversial to suggest that there's aspects of the game that are dated, but they're the same kind of things I love about Ocarina of Time or Mystical Ninja. Not the obvious stuff, but the intangible moment in history atmospheric stuff. It's a big wide-eyed, open-hearted adventure that's made me smile far more than I ever thought it would. There's plenty of cool post-apocalyptic moss-covered machinery and ethereal weirdness, but it doesn't take any of it nearly as seriously as its loudest fans have. Final Fantasy VII was developed by a team who were used to designing games for a Nintendo audience and in turn they offered some of that charm and vision to PlayStation owners. I've become a fan, but I don't regret leaving it for so long. It's a real treat to be so endeared to one of your long-standing white whales. Oh man. The rules of these lists can be a real heartbreaker at times. I'm really glad that I held off the PS4 release of Dragon Quest XI last year. But I didn't think the Switch version would be such a step up from what was presented there. Not such a step up that I can consider an entirely different new 2019 game mind, but one that totally justifies the weight. Dragon Quest has been a niche property over here at best, Jedward endorsements notwithstanding. 
coming in as a relative newcomer, you can really lap up the benefits of the series being such a phenomenon in Japan. Dragon Quest is as important as Zelda or Mario in Japan, and each entry comes into development with that same sense of prestige on its shoulders. Playing Eleven, you can really see everything that comes with that. The old NES chip tunes are now gorgeous orchestral themes. The fun Akira Toriyama monster sprites are incredibly detailed and animated 3D models. The gameplay systems and structure are built on over three decades of experimentation and refinement. Dragon Quest XI NES is as good a JRPG as you can get. The story and characters are way beyond what I'd anticipated. Every member of your party is brilliant, quirky, flawed, but wholehearted and virtuous. I'd expected a group of shallow tropes, but I was always invested in each other's personal stories. Somehow over the years I'd been led to believe that Dragon Quest was a terribly vanilla RPG. I don't want to spit on the fools that told me that. The elephant in the room here is how much the game reminded me of Ocarina of Time. Without daring to spoil anything, there's an early twist that brought me that same kind of existential gut punch, and from that moment on I was stuck into the story. Dragon Quest XI has those same kinds of hard narrative swings, and handles them so beautifully, but it also shares all kind of time's sense of the weird and whimsical. This is a really sweet and funny game. Most importantly, you can talk to a cow. This game had me feeling things that I hadn't felt in a horribly long time. It's also got a fair amount in common with early Dragon Ball, beyond Toriyama's designs. Each new town feels like the start of a new story arc. Daft wee drama is filled with charming oddball side characters. Self-contained enough to feel satisfying whenever you bring one to a close, but not so much that it loses sight of the main quest. I was excited to go to new places and see new things. The towns look incredible too, no repeated house assets or any of that shit. Everything is bespoke and fantastically detailed. This game is such a fucking treat just to be in. There's big high concept towns with punny names. There's one called Galopolis and everyone loves horses. I can't believe how good this game is. RPGs aren't even my fucking thing, and this is still one of my favourite games in ages. If I had deemed it suitable for entry into 2019's top 10, it would easily sit within the top 2. With some sorrow, I'll have to commiserate it with my old Game of the Year award.